Well, welcome to everybody who is right here at Princeton Theological Seminary, and welcome to our, what I believe is a massive online audience from uh, all corners of the globe. We are delighted that you're here with us. I'm Paul Jones of the University of Virginia, and I'm very honored to moderate this first session. Our plenary speaker is Devin Singh. Devon teaches at Dartmouth College and is also a faculty associate in Dartmouth's Consortium of Studies in Race, Migration, and Sexuality. His work is in the fields of religious thought in the modern West, the history of Christian thought, philosophy of religion, and ethics. Um, this is not the first time that Devon has been in a Bart adjacent space, um, I'm pleased to say, so I know that he will offer a tremendous kickoff lecture for this conference. He is the author of Divine Currency, The Theological Power of Money in the West, and also Economy and Modern Christian Thought. As our respondent today, after Devin's lecture, we have Andrea White of Union Theological Seminary. I think that's all you need to hear from me, so I will turn it over to Professor Singh. Good morning, everyone. Okay. So most articulations of Christian belief emphasize the ongoing living presence of Christ as Savior and Lord. Christ is depicted as reigning over a kingdom that, while distinct from this world, is supreme over it and exerts influence on earthly and historical matters. These fundamental claims, alongside the contrasting reality that, to put it plainly, Christ is nowhere to be seen, give rise to various coping strategies within Christianity. In order to establish a founder as divine, living, reigning, and somehow near and at hand, Christian thought has developed innovative methods of presence, even while affirming and celebrating forms of absence. These strategies lead to novel lines of thinking, the establishment of new institutions and patterns of community that have played a substantial role in the development of the church, as well as societies shaped by its presence. Now, modern and contemporary theologians have given little attention to the ascension of Christ as a point of doctrine. Douglas Farrow, one of the few who has devoted extensive work to it, admits that, quote, the doctrine of the ascension has become an enigma, if not an embarrassment. In many treatments, it often functions as an afterthought to the resurrection, which certainly is not short on engagement. Other Christian thinkers have focused on parousia, the return of Christ, lumping discussion of the ascension in as a brief precursor to this more climactic event. Few have devoted reflection to the rather significant movement in the Christological drama of Christ that discusses Christ's removal and absence from history. Yet the ascension marks the age of the church, the quote unquote time between, and as such seems rather significant as a doctrine to grapple with. The paucity of direct interrogation of ascension and with it the reality of Christ's glaring absence makes Christians something like fish unable to understand what water means. For the ascension and all that, in, that it entails is the water in which the church swims and as such may at times be too close to notice or call out from a critical distance. Ascension furthermore captures something crucial about the contemporaneous experience of all believers, outside of the first disciples at least who enjoyed direct access to Jesus. It also has relevance to non-believing observers of Christianity and its claims and its adherents. The resurrection is a kind of settled history and event so far in the past that it remains inaccessible. The current absence of Christ, however, is not approached under the auspices of resurrection so much as ascension. Everyone has current empirical access to the fact of the missing Christ and can make up their minds about it in a way that they cannot about the reportage conveyed on the resurrection. And to the empirically obvious absence of Christ in the present, Christians offer the doctrine of ascension as a response. Ascension is a more, dare I say, significant doctrine than resurrection today, if only because it bears the pressure of current history, personal empirical observation, and present interrogation. All eyes in the present are on, or could be on, the missing Christ, as it were, and have been for 2,000 years. The doctrine of the ascension as an answer to that void, that lack at the heart of a tradition that pro proclaims a risen and reigning Lord, therefore is forced to do incredible work and bear an immense burden. As such, it deserves more consideration as a point of doctrine and theological reflection. 
The ascension represents a major, if not the major vulnerability in Christianity and functions as a space holder and mask for the problem that the church faces. Its risen and exalted Lord is nowhere to be found. The king's body is absent. The throne appears empty. This glaring absence and the varying responses to it have social, political, psychological, and of course, theological effects. In what follows, I first want to review this notion of ascension and the absence it signifies and explore why I think it's significant for the life and identity of the church and society is impacted by it. I also want to review what I describe as coping strategies, responses to the void, to the lack of Christ that have shaped Christian thought and practice. These I divide into policies of presence and affirmations of absence. I then consider some of the political theological consequences of the ascension and these coping strategies. Focusing on one of these strategies, namely the Eucharist, takes us to Reformation debates that center on questions about the absent ascended Christ, the location of his body, and the nature of apprehending and representing that body on earth. This will take us finally to Karl Barth's own commentary on one aspect of this debate and will lead to an exploration of his stance on the ascension. Such inquiries interest me primarily because of the kinds of politics and social arrangements and institutions that emerge out of varying stances on these issues. Debates about the nature and location of Christ's body relate directly to, to debates about the nature, power, and efficacy of various social and political bodies. They also have bearing on how one values actual fleshly bodies. While we can argue that it means many things, ascension is a marker of absence, loss, and void within Christianity. And with such loss, ascension also marks a trauma, indeed a kind of founding trauma within the tradition. Christ is left and the church has been abandoned. Yet the scant theological reflections on ascension suggest a triumphalism typical of denial. Rather than confronting the trauma of loss, ascension, read together with resurrection doctrine, quickly moves to celebrate the apparent exaltation of Christ. Following the trajectory of resurrection with its celebration of victory over death, this upward movement of Christ out of the grave is seen to carry forward seamlessly with this upward movement into the clouds and away from earth, history, and materiality. But difference remains. The joy, celebration, and bewilderment seen in the disciples' reunion with their risen Lord stand in contrast to the shocked posture of longing toward heaven as their risen Lord departs. Indeed, the disciples were given no space to process this loss, but were immediately rebuked, apparently by angels, for their understandable shock and traumatized frozenness. As Luke writes in Acts 1, 10 and 11, while Jesus was going and the disciples were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So given barely a heartbeat's pause to take in and process the reality of the loss of their Savior and Lord, these disciples were told to turn away from this loss and the understandable longing it evoked, and to take consolation that such loss and longing would be compensated for by restoration. The hole in their life would be filled, their abandonment would be temporary. 2,000 years have passed since his promise. Each new generation of believers must either regard themselves at, as that much closer to its fulfillment or reinterpret its fulfillment otherwise. Such options include the possibility that fulfillment as such will never arrive. The doctrine of the ascension functions as a marker and symbol for the trauma of abandonment and the void that lie at the heart of Christianity. It represents the church's endeavor to confront and portray this trauma serving as a primary coping mechanism for it in the manner of theological elaboration and justification. The doctrine paints such loss in a positive light, suppressing the grief of such absence and attempting to transform it into a celebration of Christ's victorious presence in heaven. The doctrine initiated two millennia of speculation around the nature of bodies, both individual and political, literal and figurative, and spurred questions about the ways we might symbolically represent absent bodies or even like make them present. It also created significant political outcomes and implications for managing governed bodies. <clears throat> While certainly a, re a revisionist reading, my emphasis on ascension as abandonment and absence finds some interesting resonance with another minority tradition, that of Christian iconography of the empty throne. 
While such imagery has a long pre-Christian history of use and interpretation, it is appropriated in Christian art and makes theological claims. Some interpret this tradition, known as the Hetoimasia, as a symbol of vacancy and of the Deus Absconditus, the hidden god, a god that for many remains silent and absent. For most Christians in this tradition, however, the empty throne represents the anticipation of Christ's long-deferred return and a longing for his parousia, his arrival, or, or his appearing. This term, hetoimatsia, means preparation and refers to the preparation of the judgment seat of Christ and the culmination of all things in the eschaton. Often, the imagery of the empty throne is accompanied by a closed book, symbolizing the accounts by which all will be judged on the last days. It signifies the belief that Christ, who is risen and ascended, will return to judge the living and the dead. The empty throne serves as a reminder of the end times and of this present time as one of respite, where mercy still exists before judgment will eventually prevail. In addition to the book of Revelation, it also draws on, for instance, Pauline language, as suggested here, of a current state of incom incompletion in the reign of Christ and a coming fulfillment of divine lordship. And here this anticipation, this language of anticipation of a future state is highlighted. While some liturgical interpretations may downplay the significance of the absence, presenting it as a provisional reality, I think the empty throne tradition allows for a more direct reckoning, reckoning with ascension as abandonment, symbolizing an absentee ruler. Furthermore, theopolitically, the absence of Christ paves the way for the emergence of ecclesial authority and sacramental power, wherein the church authorities govern in Christ's absence. The absence of Christ's physical body opens up space for priestly bodies to manage the abandoned community in his stead. This theological basis for sacramental power reveals a cycle of denial and legitimation, where priestly representatives simultaneously deny Christ's absence while relying on it as a source of their authority. Vicarious and deputized power arise in this aftermath of abandonment. I want to turn now to several coping strategies for ascension, ways the church has responded to the absent Lord. And as I mentioned, I've grouped these into two categories, those, of, those that focus on a notion of descent and presence, finding placeholders or substitutions for the missing body of Christ. And the second category, focusing on ascent and absence, finding ways to justify or celebrate the disappearance of Christ as a form of victory. And these are not intended to be exhaustive or mutually exclusive. The first, of course, is the notion of the church as the body of Christ. And this idea has often resulted in an elision with state institutions and the development of political theologies that emphasize dominion and permanence. The merging of the church with political powers represents an anxious attempt to assert the reign of a risen king despite continued evidence to the contrary. The tensions and debates surrounding political theology stem from the need to reconcile this absent ruler with concurrent worldly powers. And this doesn't necessarily only pertain to Christendom or this overt merger of the church and state, but I think has a bearing on attempts at apolitical or counterpolitical formations as well. For bodies take up space and have a politics. Another policy emerges in connections among these diverse interpretations of the Eucharist, which are of course intertwined with this question of the church in relation to the society and state. Reflections on the Eucharist give rise to expanding and increasingly complex understandings of sacramentality and theories of representation. The various modes of Christ's presence in the Eucharist offer possibilities for authoritative representation, claimed by the roles and institutions of church and state. As Douglas Farrow puts such controversies, the difficulty here was not created by the undeniably awkward notion of Christ's body rising up into heaven, but by the necessity of bringing it down again in manifold times and places. The Eucharist represents a critical endeavor to embody Christ's presence despite his absence. Deliberations on the Eucharist occur within a broader network of assertions that depict church and society as modes of presence for the once and future king who cannot be found. Finally, a third set of strategies concern the Holy Spirit and this notion of a kind of pneumatological pleroma or fullness that focuses on miracles, charisma, and gifts of power as indications of divine presence. Emphasizing the Holy Spirit as an outpouring of power and presence may conceal its underlying purpose for comfort and solace in the face of abandonment, 
emphasizing the Holy Spirit's abundance risks minimizing Jesus's portrayal in the upper room discourse of the Spirit as a comforter for his absence. For in Jesus's words, if I do not go away, the comforter or advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. In some theological systems, the Spirit is at times portrayed as a remedy for the lack of Christ, as a filling of the void, instead of as a supplement and support, one that in fact underscores Christ's absence. Trinitarian doctrinal discussions, grappling with Jesus' statement that the Spirit cannot come until he is gone, walk the uneasy line of affirming Christ's presence through the Spirit while maintaining the Trinitarian distinction of persons and avoiding modalism. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit may be the Spirit of Christ, but it is not Christ. I call these three coping strategies of descent and presence because they either attempt to pull Christ back down to earth to enjoy his presence or assert some surrogate presence as a consolation for the void and absence left by the ascended Christ. And these are, of course, all mutually interrelated. The Eucharist as a presence of Christ's body and blood grounds the church as manifesting Christ's body on earth, a community formed and filled by the Holy Spirit. To be sure, these doctrinal loci of ecclesiology, sacramentology, and pneumatology show up differently across Christian history and have always been contested. And all three, I claim, seek a solution to this absent Christ, offering a kind of covering or an internal structure to the void and an absence left at the heart of the church's proclamation. Now to these affirmations of absence, the first being a notion that the ascension was a necessary step to remove the stumbling block and limitation of Christ's physical presence. This was a view articulated by Augustine, who affirmed that the ascension served to take the disciples' eyes off of earthly things and turn them heavenward. Christ's human nature was necessary only for human weakness as a crutch to aid belief in the invisible God but to remain physically present would be a stumbling block to the faith. And just as an aside, I mean, from the standpoint of modern and contemporary theology, where we find such an emphasis on the incarnation, on the fleshly embodied presence of Christ, and on the resurrection as the real, re the, re the, re the raising of an actual physical body and such a, such a valorization of embodiment, it is quite striking to see a contrast with somebody like Augustine who sees that as perhaps problematic. Aquinas too, sees a necessary benefit in Christ's disappearance for the sake of faith, as he claims, quote, Christ's ascension into heaven, whereby he withdrew his bodily presence from us, was more profitable for us than his bodily presence would have ever been. First of all, in order to increase our faith, which is of things unseen. Secondly, to uplift our hope heavenward. Thirdly, in order to direct the fervor of our charity to heavenly things. Furthermore, Aquinas remarkably suggests that the resurrection was not the culmination, but in fact the kind of delay for the sake of human weakness. As he writes, it was not fitting that Christ should remain upon the earth after resurrection, but it was, a, it was fitting that he should ascend heavenward. Although a heavenly place befitted Christ when he rose to immortal life, nevertheless, he delayed the ascension in order to confirm the truth of his resurrection. So in other words, Christ needed to tarry on earth, physically present among the disciples, to get them to believe in his divinity and in the reality of what the resurrection signified. But the ascension was completion and fulfillment. This emphasis on ascension over resurrection is, again, interesting to me, given what I take to be the opposite in most contemporary and modern theology. Christological and soteriological attention remain on crucifixion and resurrection as the essential dyad. To Good Friday and Easter, some may add Holy Saturday as that moment of absence, dwelling on the silence of God as Christ descends into the abyss. But few theological explorations focus on ascension as the actual centerpiece. Aquinas' claims could facilitate an interesting recentering of ascension, with the resurrection demoted to a brief but necessary delay on behalf of the fragile faith of the disciples. In both Augustine and Aquinas, then, the ascension marks a climax point where physicality and bodily presence recede, and where faith in an invisible God, a faith underscored by bodily erasure, is prioritized. Withdrawal, disembodiment, and resulting abstraction are what become necessary for the church to come to a fullness of faith. Another way that the ascension is embraced is to posit Christ as our forerunner, a trailblazer of sorts that paves the way for humanity to enter the presence of God. As God wedded to perfect humanity, the ascended Christ is the first fruits of a process intended for humanity and indeed for all of creation. 
Ascension, in this sense, is a marker of apotheosis or deification made available to those who believe. Christ's ascension marks the truth of the what and where of where believers will one day be, or for other interpreters, the what and where of where believers already are. And we can find this in the writings of Irenaeus, for example, as well as Maximus the Confessor, among many others, of course. Ascension also conveys royal imagery of Christ ascending to his throne to be seated at the right hand of the Father. In this sense, the ascension does to the human nature of Christ what was always the case for the divine nature. For the Son, the second member of the Trinity, was never not in the presence of the Father. But the ascension makes this a reality for the human nature. It's a necessary departure in order to mark the inclusion of this human nature of Christ in the Godhead, also inaugurating a kind of heavenly reign. It also parallels the ascension of the priests in the temple into the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement, granting the people of God remission of sins. Yet Jesus, the great high priest, remains and intercedes in his ongoing heavenly session, such that this atoning work is permanent and once and for all and grants the redeemed access to the Father. All three strategies affirm absence and underscore the absence of the ascension, construing this as a benefit for the church. Christianity carries out a peculiar political dramaturgy. It insists on kneeling to a king who is not there, and it invites, or quite often commands, others to do likewise. Since Christianity presents the absentee Christ as reigning over a divine kingdom that controls world, world history and politics, it's forced to imagine and institutionalize new methods of governance. The absent Christ creates space for priestly bodies to administer power in a vacuum, and as I noted, paradoxically, denying Christ's blatant absence provides new forms of political legitimacy. Christian emperors and kings will in turn learn to gain authority by claiming the ascended Christ as somehow present, although absent, invisibly ruling through them. Yet this disavowal of absence also creates institutional fragility, since the sovereign who justifies all other delegated authorities is nowhere to be found, leaving a vulnerable structure of governance. So it also creates strategies of enforced presence and coerced submission to an absent Lord while potentially valorizing the erasure of bodies that resist. What might be the types of community, modes of authority, forms of politics, modes of domination and control, and so forth, that result from such anxious attempts to mask the embarrassing absence of an exalted Lord, a void that marks the trauma of foundational abandonment that births the church? What does such foundational loss, repression of trauma, and its reemergence in certain ideologies and institutions do to the practices of governance, managing bodies, including the displacement and disappearance of certain bodies? Not only does this foundational denial of absence undergird new forms of Christian rule that require absence, but it might be able to be mobilized to, quote unquote, make absent other bodies in the service of religious, political, and economic ends. Of the many possible tropes in political theology that one could examine, I just want to note here briefly one, that of this notion of the absentee sovereign and all that it entails. Of course, we see such mythology in European political theory concerning the detached and absent king who does not directly intervene in the structures of governance. And of course, it emerges in Arthurian legends that proclaim the once and future king or await the return of the king. Once this notion of the absent or invisible sovereign has transitioned from monarchical government to forms of popular representation where the people are supposedly sovereign and occupy the side of sovereignty, an open question remains about whether they too must be erased or otherwise made invisible. Mm. White right Christianity's denial of the loss of Christ, coupled with making good theological and political use of its absence, lead to downstream effects that include making other bodies absent in the name of virtuous ends. Might this strategy of absenting certain bodies be undergirded by virtues assigned to the ascension, as seen in these strategies of absence? In other words, if it was a good thing that Jesus' pesky body was moved out of the way, so that the church could contemplate the abst abstract glory of his invisible divinity, as Augustine and Aquinas assert, might the church have institutionalized other practices of disappearance and removal 
for the sake of its mission. Now, the denigration of the body in Christianity is not a new concern, but I wonder how does valorizing the absent body or supplanting it with signs and substitutes support and intensify this denigration of individual and corporate bodies? Considering the key role played by Christianity in colonial projects, the theological dimension merits analysis. In what ways are such instances of bodily displacement and erasure an outworking of a politics of presence and absence in Christian thought? Foundational to the European colonial encounter was a genocide of native peoples that made space for colonial settlement, a set of tragic and brutal events, always accompanied by a theological discussion and legitimation. American westward settler expansion and doctrines of manifest destiny made generous use of theological imagery and justification while eliminating or sequestering indigenous populations. Part of the logic of a European and American settler colonialism was the rendering, was a rendering certain segments of the population invisible. Much of the colonial encounter included eliminating indigenous bodies. Also central was the extensive use of African bodies. The slavery complex included displacing bodies across the Atlantic and among plantations, as well as the routine separation of families and the elimination of unproductive or problematic slaves. Since bodies were used for extraction, their physical erasure was not the primary aim, but such bodies were certainly viewed as expendable and replaceable. And one can also speak of certain forms of social death, of cultural and psychological erasure carried out on the enslaved. Modern iterations include the routine invisibilization of undesired bodies in ghettos and prisons, as well as extreme forms of literally erasing and disappearing inconvenience or revolutionary bodies. So I want to turn back to one of these aforementioned coping strategies on the absence of Christ in the form of the Eucharist and take up some concerns raised in and around the Reformation. As suggested earlier, debates about the Eucharist are, of course, not unrelated to the other coping strategies of presence, those of positing the church as the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit as supplement to the void opened up upon Christ's departure. As is, of course, well documented, refigurations of the Eucharist take place in the midst of debates about the nature and boundaries of the church. Political upheaval meant that making the edges of the, of the church coterminous with the Holy Roman Empire under Christendom was no longer viable. With this, the Catholic Church's claims to spiritual and temporal authority came under greater contestation. Congruently, royal power that claimed legitimation from the church hierarchy also met resistance, meaning the upheaval around the church as the body of Christ corresponded to drastic changes in the constitution of the body politic. A theopolitics of the sociopolitical body formed the backdrop, even as debates about Christ's body in the Eucharist took center stage. Christopher Elmwood's masterful work, The Body Broken, recounts the wide-ranging social consequences of the Eucharistic debates. As he puts it, the Eucharist was the focus of more theological controversy in the 16th century than any other item of Christian confession and practice. People rioted, fought, killed, and died over theological definitions of the Eucharist. But this symbol was not simply the site upon which political struggles were concentrated. To a large extent, it served as the catalyst for those struggles. As Elwood percep percep perceptively notes, debaters recognized the political economies of power bound up with Eucharistic claims. Ecclesial and political authorities in Christendom claimed power and legitimacy in relation to the presence of the Savior's body and blood and the elements. The power in such claims was the church's control of access to the corporeality of the Savior as well as the priest's mediation of such, such access for the faithful. For Protestants, the identification of the body of Christ and the sacred host could no longer serve as the basis for social sanctity. And as a consequence, they publicized their opposition to idolatrous, pra idolatrous practices during Eucharistic processions, thus marking themselves as outsiders to the social and political body created by the Catholic religious rituals. But a new religious and political consciousness could also come to expression in relation to other symbolic deployments in which power configurations were articulated. The symbolic world constructed on the basis of the new Eucharistic symbol established new ways of relating to one's social world and made possible a new and revolutionary political praxis. I won't review Calvin's important position on the Eucharist here in response to Catholic dogma, 
transubstantiation. But I will just mention one element that carries forward to Bart's discussion. While Calvin rejected Catholic claims that the elements transformed into the material body and blood of Christ, he also rejected the more extreme Zwinglian position that the elements of the Lord's Supper were mere or naked signs. They did not merely function as symbols of belief that allowed the communicant to call to mind and reaffirm faith in the past event of the death and resurrection of Christ. Rather, something real and efficacious happened at the table. Otherwise, the sacrament appeared meaningless to Calvin. He wanted to affirm that the believer experienced the benefits of the body and blood of Christ in a real or substantial sense, without physically consuming them. And his solution was to assert that it was the Holy Spirit that conveyed the saving benefits, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, who remained in heaven with God. For Bart, too, the Holy Spirit will be a critical link between the believer and the ascended Christ. And here I just want to turn to this notion of the extra-Calvinisticum. Uh, this is, you know, was a pejorative term for Lutherans of the particular Calvinistic position. And it really relates to these questions about the Eucharist and about uh, how one defined and understood the incarnation as well as the ascension. And it raised questions about the union of these two natures, as well as to what extent the idioms of each nature were communi communicated to the other. One question at stake was whether the divine word, the Logos, was contained in some sense and perhaps even circumscribed by the human nature of Christ in the incarnation. And post-ascension, was the human nature of Jesus now, in some sense, omnipresent? Luther's position, known as sacramental union, emphasized this real presence of Christ in, with, and under the elements. And some of the theological undergirdings of this was that the Son was, in some sense, contained, and for some critics, by implication, then limited, by the body of Christ during the Incarnation. The flesh of the ascended Christ is now, in some way, also omnipresent with the divine nature, with the Spirit of Christ, due to this communication of idioms. And this allows the body to appear alongside the bread as a real material presence. Calvin's assertion then was that we need to go back and check our theology of the incarnation. He would say the divine nature, the son, was never circumscribed by the human nature of Christ, even in the incarnation. It was and remains omnipresent, referred to as the logos e sarcos. The human nature of Christ was and remains limited, circumscribed, local, not omnipresent, and is in some sense seated at the right hand of the Father, this notion of logos and sarcos. And as stated, the benefits then of this union of the divine and human nature are communicated via the Holy Spirit. So there's an immaterial, but nevertheless, a spiritual presence, Christ in the Eucharist. Just to know some of the sort of political and theopolitical implications of this, as a, one contemporary Reformed pastor and theologian, Kevin DeYoung notes, thinking about this uh, significance of the extra Calvinisticum, as he writes, all this means, because the divine nature did not undergo essential change, is that in coming to earth, the Son of God did not abdicate his rule, but extended it. It also means, because the human nature was not swallowed up by the divine, that the Son's earthly obedience was free and voluntary. I find this striking, right, in terms of a, a notion of how do we maintain power and reign and also extend it, very overt political consequences, as well as what does it mean to secure submission and even to secure a kind of consent to submission. It's also quite striking. All right, so a bit on Bart and his response to this. Uh, over the course of his career, demonstrates a, a sort of changing position on this. So the first is sort of an enthusiastic affirmation of this extra Calvinisticum. He sides very strongly with the Reformed position, with Calvin's position on this, but eventually comes to take what looks like more of a qualified stance on the assertions made by Calvin and some of the other theologians. So Bart's basic concern really is to, is this language about the logos e sarcos, this divine nature thought of in abstract, in some sense, apart from the human nature. So as we know, right, for Bart, everything is about Jesus Christ. And so the, the Logos e sarcos and en sarcos are both aspects of the one person of Jesus Christ. And we can't think about them as separate or in the abstract. And as he writes, that the deity is outside or extra 
the humanity of Jesus Christ is correct as a description of the free grace of the incarnation. So as a way to talk about the sort of divine priority, the sovereignty of God in initiating this. But post-Christum, looking back on the incarnation from where we stand, this statement can only be one of unbelief. If we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe he is the one person who is true man and at the same time, true God. So for Bart, this moment of incarnation or the humiliation of the divine son and this moment of ascension or the exaltation are not sort of two distinct sequential moments. They represent this eternal unity, this eternal reality of Christ. And really, all of these events of Christology, the incarnation, cross, resurrection, and ascension are part of this singular act, this defining act and event of Jesus Christ. So Bart's emphasis here is really to think about the ascension primarily atemporally, rather than to think of it and get caught up in this series of sequential movements. He will want to maintain, of course, that the concrete history, this material history of Jesus matters in some sense. And yet, his assertion remains that the ascension has somehow always already happened in Christ. Strikingly, ascension is a kind of revelation. It shows what was always already the case in incarnation. And Jesus is not spatially elsewhere, but is in the direct presence of the transcendent father and in some sense veil. So just as Jesus Christ was always who he is for Christians, the son of God made flesh, so he was and is always the son of man who is ascended and seated at the right hand of the father and intercedes on behalf of the church. Characteristically then, there's a tension between the transcendent, stable, eternal identity of God and how God appears to humankind historically. While incarnation, resurrection, and ascension appear as temporally distinct historical moments, Bart resists any notion of change or progression in this identity of God in such regard. Jesus Christ was and always is the subject of these events and realities. And as noted, Bart really emphasizes ascension as a kind of revelation. As uh, Andrew Burgess notes in his excellent study of Bart's view of the ascension, quote, the ascension finds its goal in the revelation of the unity of God and humanity, exaltation and humiliation, which always was present in Jesus Christ, although previously veiled. In other words, the ascension reveals the full truth of Christ as the God-man, unveiling what was veiled in his incarnate form before the cross and resurrection. And yet, I think, perhaps ironically, in my view, this revelation and unveiling are constituted by a new veiling. For Christ is removed from access by sight and taken into the presence of the Father where only faith can go. While the incarnation was a veiling of revelation, the ascension was a revelation of a veiling. In reading the resurrection and ascension together, Bart sees them all as a subset parousia. In Burgess's words again, the parousia or coming occurs primarily in three parts, resurrection and ascension, the continued coming of the Holy Spirit, and Jesus' awaited return at the eschaton. As Burgess puts it, the coming of the Spirit is dependent upon the resurrection and ascension as the beginning of the post-Easter history. And in particular, the gift of the Spirit is a gift from the risen and ascended Jesus Christ. Jesus, while absent via ascension, is not simply absent, and in grace continues to reach into the time of the fallen creation and bring saving transformation in the knowledge of salvation. He does not cease to save, but rather in the Spirit is present and act on the basis of his heavenly life and authority to mediate salvation and thus to make fallen humanity sharers with him in his grace. Okay, so some just concluding remarks here, thinking about debating Bart on ascension here. On one hand, we can see that Bart's position doesn't align with the terms of my exploration. I don't think they need to be in contradiction, but the emphases are different. Bart will have no time for my dwelling on the differences between apprehending the resurrected Christ and encountering the absent ascended Christ. While I'm not asserting a change in the nature of Jesus Christ, I am claiming that the historical progression matters for the experience of the disciples and consequently for the church. While history matters to some degree for Bart, more important is the eternal, stable, transcendent reality of Jesus Christ as always both descended and ascended one. On the other hand, there is a sense in which Bart does affirm the absence of which I speak. The ascended Christ is absent and elsewhere. To be sure, this elsewhere is not spatial, but rather speaks to Christ's transition into the presence of God and, and his place of holiness and transcendence, which Bart maintains Humans do not have direct access. And so Christ is hidden. Absence is affirmed. And yet Barton is quick to assert that the absent Christ is mediated to believers via the Holy Spirit. 
My response is that the parousia of the Holy Spirit is not the parousia of Christ. Otherwise, the church's eschatological orientation toward that return is misguided, for the Savior has already arrived. But if, in fact, the destiny toward which the church trudges is still in some sense in st is still in, a, in some sense really deferred, if it maintains that Christ has indeed not yet returned, then the, desi the, the desire that orients the church toward some future stems from a lack. Confident affirmations of divine superabundance notwithstanding, there is a real scarcity at the heart of the tradition as it awaits the return. Such scarcity has, of course, emerged regularly in discussions of closed communion, criteria for belonging to the church, grounds for excommunication, and methods of verifying the church, the spirit's presence, for instance. Part of this, of course, is also a tension between a kind of realized eschatology that proclaims that everything is accomplished and a deferred, historically sensitive eschatology that acknowledges that what might have always been always already accomplished is certainly not yet fully manifest. Lingering questions that I have, you know, as I continue to think about and want to delve into Bart on this issue, what are some more explicit connections between Bart's views on the ascension and his politics, particularly this notion of the Christian community and civil community? Bart certainly speaks about this notion of the royal man who is exalted and seated at the right hand of God, and there's a politics there. I continue to remain uncomfortable with Bard's strong emphasis on lordship and sovereignty. To be sure, it's qualified with a reminder of Christ as the humble servant, but it strikes me that lordship, sovereignty, and exaltation seem like the first and last word. And with that is certainly a concern with a kind of triumphalism that can emerge within sectors of the church and certainly within Bardian circles as well. And so I wonder how do his views on the ascension reinforce or subvert some of these other problematic outcomes that I've highlighted? Is this a doubling down on the exaltation that comes from this absence and the bodily erasure that follows in its wake, or perhaps the seeds of some sort of unmasking? Thank you. Thank you, Devin, for <laughs> your paper and especially for launching the conference with the first paper presentation. Thank you, Paul, for moderating us and keeping us in order. Um, I, I want to also thank you for foregrounding the complicated matter of the Ascension because of an issue that I have pretty much every Easter Sunday, with pastors being frankly embarrassed, as you put it, by this, this trauma of the absent Christ. And I, I always seem dissatisfied with the apology, the denial, the defense of this, this embarrassing situation for the preacher. So I want to thank you for foregrounding this com complicated matter. Your discussion compels really important questions, and I, and I look forward to our conversation with everyone here, virtually and in, in the room. So first, the matter of the absent body. I want to place it in conversation with Bard's claims about knowledge of God. Bart says in Church Dogmatics 2.1 that knowing God, we necessarily know his hiddenness. This is a, a point you raised in your remarks. And there's a kind of unknowing in the knowing, which entails, I would suggest, a posture of dispossession that Bart invokes within the task of theology. So theology, in this sense, is a practice of dispossession by which to interrogate hopes for history and history's faith in very particular identities and the strategies that are used to bolster and protect them. So theology interrogates the construction of the exalted, but absent sovereign as a mechanism of power. Theology's critique is the insistence that we do not possess God, that theology defies the logic of competition and commodities. So in this sense, we might say the ascension is the theological substance that marks the nature of Bart's theological method. So this is, you might say, another affirmation of the ascension. But I might suggest that it's not so much a defense as a descriptive account. Um, and it's, it's pointing to the way in which um, Bart is setting out the task of theology.
But this posture of dispossession is also a resistance to a metaphysics of presence in the knowledge of God. And it's no doubt what inspired Graham Ward's pairing of Bart and Derrida back in his 1995 book. And Ward picks up on Bart's neo-Kantian anthropology and says, our knowledge is always a recollection. Our knowledge is never a complete knowledge of what is, of the thing in itself, only of what is constituted in recollection. The dichotomy between impressions received and impressions created by our inevitable, inevitable involvement in what is received and how is unbridgeable. It's unresolvable. As Bart explains in Church Dogmatics 1.1, God with us becomes the truth for us as recollection and also as promise. I'm quoting him there. So memory recalls the presence of a promise once given and as yet unfulfilled. Jesus Christ is the name of the remembered promise of a future presence. So quoting Bart in uh, Romans, our memory of God is, is one of absence, not ontological participation. As he puts it, it's the memory of that lost relationship with God. The imago dei is the negative side of immediacy, the recognition of always and only having mediation. This lack of immediacy in the God-human encounter means that our theological language, our theological task is, I like to call it uh, in recurring terms, a hermeneutic phenomenology. It requires a mediation. It requires interpretation. So the ascension and the absent Christ also calls to mind, and I forgive me, I'm free associating here a little bit, but I couldn't help but think of Lynn Tonstad's discussion of her apocalyptic ecclesiology in her volume, God and Difference. And I'm going to quote her, actually paraphrase her slightly. Christ's resurrected body joins itself to the materiality of the entire world. So in this sense, the absent Christ actually is affirming something about the embodied nature of creation. But resurrection's promise seems to entail a disavowal of experience in history. This is precisely the point you're making about the ascension. The ascension of the resurrected body entails, of course, the disappearance of Christ. The body of Christ is lost from sight, perceived as absent. And the absent body seems to imply a repudiation of presence. Lynn Tonstad goes on to say that we must remember that the risen Christ remains unrecognizable. This means most significantly that, again, back to the matter of possession, we do not possess the body of Christ, that we cannot control or order bodies based on some Christic ideal that we have in view. So in this sense, there's a positive take on the ascended Christ that has implications for political theology. The resurrected Christ eludes our perception and our grasp. The church neither is nor has the body of Christ. Tonstead says when we forget this, our representations of materiality become idolatrous and violent. And here I think there's a resonance with Bart's um, insistence on a non-totalizing uh, view in his uh, theological method. But I, I wonder if whether there's another question lurking that's behind the scenes of this embarrassing situation, and that's namely the theodicy question. The problem is not just a matter of trauma, as you point out. With an institutionalized absence, you tell us, and I'm quoting you, the sovereign who justifies all other delegated authorities is nowhere to be found, which leads to strategies of coerced submission to an absent lord while potentially valorizing the erasure of bodies. This isn't just a problem for justice for erased bodies. It's a problem for God. So I wonder if there's a, um, an implicit, an implicit theodicy question in this problem of the absent Christ. But I also think that it points to the malleability of, of the ways and the malleability of doctrine for political repurposing. And I'm struck by the way in which there's often a focus on crucifixion and atonement and death for certain kinds of political theologies and what and the implications there on, on bodies, whether 
uh, literal or social death. And I have in, in mind here, of course, womanist critiques of, of, of atonement. But I, I wonder if this um, interrogation of the ascension is showing, again, the malleability of doctrine and the ways in which empire kind of takes whatever is ready at hand. And it does what it will with whatever uh, it wishes. So I guess in the end, I'm suggesting why pick on ascension?